I guess we'll get started, everybody. So thank you for joining in for today's SP Grid webinar series. Hopefully everybody's staying safe with all of the various changes with the, the coronavirus stuff and such going on. Uh, we have two presentations today. They'll be recorded and up on the SP Grid YouTube channel. Uh, for if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to send them to the host in the chat and we'll moderate those, ask them in the break. If you have any suggestions for future topics for webinars, if you have an, an interesting story that you'd like to tell, or you know somebody who you think might have an interesting story, feel free to let us know, either through the chat or for, through the usual channels of contacting us. Today, we have two speakers, both uh, from the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. They're both gonna be telling us about cryo-EM structures. Our first one, I believe, Rinka, you're going first. And Rinka Jain is a assistant professor at the School of Medicine there. And she'll be talking to us today about cryo-EM structure and dynamics of DNA polymerase delta and high fidelity DNA synthesis. So with that, Rinka, can you share your screen? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Pete. Thank you for presenting. Um... Very exciting opportunity for us. I hope everyone can see my slides now in the presentation mode. Well, yep, looks good. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Rinku Jain, and today I'm going to be talking about our work on the structure and dynamics of a eukaryotic uh, replicative polymerase, uh, which is Paul Delta. And uh, this was work done at Mount Sinai uh, with Professor Anil Agarwal. So um, this slide here um, show is a schematic of the eukaryotic replication fork, which is composed of 200 or more proteins um, that work together to ensure that the genomic DNA is synthesized and repaired with high fidelity. And so the main players here are the three replicative polymerases uh, shown in blue, uh, Paul's alpha, Paul Delta and Paul Epsilon. And these are multi subunit polymerases which belong to the B family. And so Paul Alpha here uh, synthesizes de novo short RNA DNA primers, which are then extended on the lagging strand by Paul Delta. Uh, Paul Epsilon is thought to be the leading strand polymerase, but a Paul Delta can also participate in leading strand synthesis in the absence of Paul Epsilon. And in addition to this role in um, DNA synthesis, Paul Delta is also required for the maturation of Okazaki fragments, as well as for DNA repair. And so it's not surprising that mutations in Paul Delta have been associated with a large number of cancers and other diseases. And so there's um, a lot of interest in understanding the architecture of Paul Delta and how it participates in these various pathways and coordinates with other players in these processes. And so um, this enzyme, which is crucial for DNA synthesis and repair is conserved across all eukaryotes. And in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's composed of three polypeptides. The largest polypeptide is Paul three, and at the end terminus, it harbors a large catalytic domain which carries two activities, a polymerase or a DNA synthesis activity and an exonuclease or proofreading activity, which is required to remove errors from the newly synthesized uh, strand. Um, the C terminus harbors two small cysteine rich domains, which we call cis-AD and cis-BD of which CIS-BD is required for interaction with the other subunits. Um, the two smaller subunits are called Paul 31 and 32. These lack any sort of enzymatic activity, but they are required for protein-protein interaction. And so 31 and 32, we call them the regulatory subunits. Uh, genetic experiments have shown that both Paul 3 and 31 are essential for viability. Uh, 32 is not essential, but as we might expect, mutations in 32 lead to defects in genome synthesis and repair. Now, the structures of both the catalytic module and the regulatory module have been determined by X-ray crystallography. So on the bottom right is the structure of the catalytic module, which was determined by Mike Swan, 
a former postdoc in a Niels lab. And uh, the structure revealed a canonical B family fold um, with the polymerase active site here and the exonuclease active site here, separated by more than about 40 angstroms. Um, and the overall uh, significance of the structure derives from the fact that it served as a framework for understanding the basis of high fid fidelity DNA synthesis by the catalytic module. On the bottom left is the structure of the human homologue of the regulatory module. And this structure was determined by Tahirov's group. And it revealed an elongated molecule with a number of domains that are traditionally um, so, or typically associated with uh, DNA binding or oligonucleotide binding. But experiments with the human homologues of this protein did not show any DNA binding. So these were seminal structures, but what was missing is how they come together in 3D to crosstalk and coordinate the activity of the holoenzyme. And I think that was partly because of the challenges associated with crystallizing this large complex. And so after crystallization efforts failed, we initially tried small angle scattering to derive the overall shape information for this protein. And so on uh, shown here is an average shape envelope from ab initial sh shape envelope for the holoenzyme derived from SACS data. And in the middle panel is a, a rigid body model obtained from MD simulations. And both these models are in qualitative agreement with each other, which sort of show a globular catalytic module attached to uh, elongated regulatory modules. Um, so despite these overall similarities, uh, the distance distribution function calculated from these models and shown in red here deviates uh, slightly at large distances from the experimental distance distribution function in black, suggesting that there's some sort of flexibility. And so that is sort of shown schematically in the bottom here, where the regulatory module and the catalytic module um, occupy different orientations with respect to each other. And so from SACS, we know now that this molecule is along and it's flexible, explaining why this is a, com a challenging system for crystallization. And so to gain further insight, we also tried some cryo-EM. This was in 2008, and we tried um, cryo-EM with negatively stained Paul Delta. In fact, three different variants of Paul Delta and a typical micrograph shown here. And as you can see, the micrograph is quite heterogeneous. Um, we don't really see consistent shape or size for the particles. And so at that time, we were unable to process this data any further. And so fast forward to 2018, um, after all the fantastic advances in cryo-EM software and hardware, we revisited the uh, the, the EM um, efforts, and this time um, with cryo-EM, and so typical micrograph for Paul Delta, holoenzymes shown here. Um, we can clearly see the particles, but again, they are, they are too small for us to be, to identify consistent shape, but we were very quickly able to do some uh, 2D classifications and some promising classes are shown in red here. We see features that are consistent with what we know about Paul Delta. For example, um, this tube-like density um, or feature emerging from the center of the molecule, which we attribute to the binding of DNA. We're also able to see some high resolution features, for example, secondary structures and some of these class averages. And so this was a very promising development for us. Uh, however, um, one data set was not enough for us to build the entire EM structure. And so we collected additional data sets. Um, uh, the three data sets that we used were subjected to multiple rounds of cleaning using iterative rounds of 2D and 3D classifications. We also did some focused 3D classifications with signal subtraction to, to ensure we were picking particles that correspond to the holoenzyme. And so the clean particle sets were then merged and used to calculate the initial maps, um, which went to about 3.4 angstroms. And so the initial maps are shown on the left here. We clearly see density for the catalytic module 
with DNA emerging from it. And so the X-ray structure of the catalytic module docked on the cryo-EM map shown on the right. We were also able to dock homology models for CIS-BD, the cysteine-rich module, and for Pol-31. However, the density for Pol-32, which is the third subunit of this whole enzyme, was quite fragmented and streaky. And we, when we looked at the density and its smearing very carefully, we reasoned that the fragmentation and the smearing was perhaps coming from um, movement, relative movement of the catalytic module and the regulatory module with respect to a pivot which lies at the interface. And so as one moved away from the catalytic domain, the density um, was, uh, became more and more fragmented. And so to improve the overall density, we went back to ref our um, refinement process and we did some multibody refinement within Reliant, which led to a significant improvement in the density. And so on the next slide here, I um, uh, show some uh, snapshots of the cryo-EM density for different regions of Paul Delta. On the top are, is the Paul 3 active site. Um, cryo-EM density for DNA and density for CIS-BD at the interface of the catalytic and regulatory module. And as you can see, there's excellent definition for the density for, uh, uh, for this region, uh, both before and after multibody refinement. But what was extremely striking um, was the improvement in density for Paul 32 And so here I compare um, the cryo -EM density, both before and after. And as you can see, we see a significant improvement for this region of the molecule to a point that we are now able to trace the complete structure, including the backbone for Paul 32 And so if I move to the next slide, on the left then is the cryo-EM density for Paul delta after multibody refinement. And on the right here is the model that we build into this density. And so right away, we see that consistent with the small angle scattering data, Paul delta is indeed a very elongated molecule. It has a maximum dimension of about 150 angstroms. Um, um, and whereas it's only about 60 angstroms wide in the other dimension. Um, what was surprising, though, was the fact that despite the presence of many oligonucleotide binding modules, the regulatory module is positioned far from the DNA and it does not make any contact with the DNA that was used for these cryo -EM studies. So instead, it's positioned close to the exonuclease domain of the catalytic module. And this is clearer in the figure on the right. So if you may recall, um, the catalytic module harbors um, a polymerase activity and an exonuclease activity, which are separated by about 40 angstroms. And in our structure, the regulatory module is positioned in the vicinity of the exonuclease active site, which places it about 40 angstroms away from the polymerase active site. Also in our structure, the first cysteine-rich module is disordered, but we, are, we were able to completely trace the second cysteine-rich module or cis-PD. Now, um, CIS-BD, in fact, has a very pivotal role in the organization of Paul Delta. It emerges as the keystone of Paul Delta assembly. So CIS-BD is in, establishes interactions simultaneously with the regulatory module as well as with the catalytic module. And so these simultaneous interactions are responsible for bringing both the modules together in 3D and, as, and, and giving uh, Paul Delta its distinct elongated architecture. I do want to point out that a number of these amino acids at the interface of CIS-PT and the regulatory module had been identified previously by genetic studies and biochemical studies. But these amino acids that we identify at the interface of CIS-PT and the catalytic module are novel because these were not expected based on previous studies. And in fact, this interface is functionally relevant because recent work has shown that at least one of these amino acids, which is the human homologue of lice, sorry, the human uh, 
counterpart of lysine 1072, when it's mutated, it leads to um, a, a specific uh, disorder characterized by replicative stress, and that leads to immunodeficiencies. And so um, this, this interface um, has some functional relevance, and I'll go into this a, li a little bit more in details in the later slides. Um, in addition to um, nucleating the assembly of Paul Delta, CISBD has another unique feature in that it contains a 4-iron 4 4-sulfur four cluster. And this, again, is consistent with genetic studies that were done previously and that predicted the presence of the iron-sulfur cluster here. But from our work now, we can uh, we can decipher the coordination geometry of this iron sulfur cluster and its immediate environment. And so what we see then is that the iron sulfur cluster is coordinated by four conserved cysteines that um, sort of occupy this loop in between the two anti-parallel helices. But interestingly, in addition to these four cysteines, it's also coordinated by arginine, which is conserved in the sequence um, in all Paul Delta sequences, but it is absent in other replicated polymerases. And we think this arginine is very important and it probably explains why CISBD can act as a putative red ox sensor. And so that is um, depicted schematically in this slide here. And so if I may take a minute to explain this, um, uh, positively charged amino acids such as arginine are known to stabilize the reduced state of the iron sulfur cluster. So the iron sulfur cluster can exist in the reduced two plus state or the oxidized three plus state. And we know that the ability of arginine to stabilize the reduced state of the cluster, which is shown here, is important for the activity of Paul Delta because that supports normal rate of DNA synthesis. When the sulfur is oxidized to the three plus state, it has been shown by electrochemical experiments that the enzyme stalls. And so that probably leads to a halt in DNA synthesis. So, um, so what we can suggest here is a scenario by which um, CISPD acts as a redox sensor. So, um, uh, so it, it appears that when the oxidative stress in the cell exceeds a certain critical level, despite the presence of arginine, the um, cluster might be converted to the oxidized three plus state, leading to a halting of Paul Delta and therefore stopping mutagenic DNA synthesis under conditions of oxidative stress. Conversely, when this oxidative stress resolves, arginine, uh, the presence of arginine in the vicinity of this cluster might help it revert to the reduced two plus state and therefore allowing DNA synthesis to restart. And so this provides a very, um, this provides a framework for explaining how iron sulfur cluster and the associated arginine might enable CISBD to act as a redox switch, allowing it to resume and halt DNA synthesis in response to oxidative stress. Mm. In addition to CISBD, Another important feature about the Paul Delta holoenzyme that we learn from our structure is this relatively sparse interface between the catalytic module and the regulatory module. And so there's very few direct contacts between the two molecules as a result of which this interface is very sparse. It's lined by the exonuclease domain of the catalytic module on one side, the um, Paul 31 from the regulatory module on the other side and CISBD at the base. And there are amino acids from Paul 31, which extend towards the exonuclease domain, but do not make any additional contacts or any contacts at all. And so uh, based on the absence of direct contacts between the two, we reason that this is a very flexible interface, which is perhaps allowing the relative movement of the two modules about um, a pivot which overlaps with the iron sulfur cluster. And this is consistent with the results of multibody analysis. And so when we perform um, uh, principal component analysis of the positional variances from multibody analysis, all within Reliant, we see that the top two eigenvectors, which are shown here, 
account for more than 35% per percent of the relative motion between the catalytic module and the regulatory module. What we also see is that the distribution of amplitude along these eigenvectors is unimodal. And this suggests that the motion between the two modules is continuous, it's not discrete. And the motions kind of shown on the left here um, along eigenvector one, um, the regulatory module um, is moving around the periphery of the catalytic module and the motion represented, represented by eigenvector two can be described as the movement of the regulatory module towards and away from the catalytic module. But again, what was very surprising was that the motion represented by eigenvector one was consistent with the predicted dynamics using normal mode analysis. And so this correspondence between experimentally observed motion and motion project, uh, predicted by normal mode analysis um, suggests that this flexibility is an inherent feature of the Paul Delta architecture. And so it's probably functionally relevant. And so what is the functional relevance of this motion? And so um, I just want to remind here that um, we know both from the st structure of the holoenzyme and the isolated core that the Paul active site and the exonuclease active site are located about 40 angstroms away from each other. And so we think that this flexibility between the regulatory and the catalytic module is important to allow the steric transfer of a mismatch primer from the Paul active site, 40 angstroms away to the exonuclease active site so that the errors can be corrected. And so the primer can be switched back to the polymerase active site for DNA synthesis. And so um, um, we are currently doing um, experiments to test this hypothesis, but I think this in addition to its role in primer transfer, the flexibility may also be important for um, Paul Delta to coordinate with the other players in the numerous pathways that it participates in. Um, another functional relevance of the flexibility between the catalytic and the regulatory module is born from the um, mapping of disease mutations. So as I um, may have mentioned, um, disease mutations have been associated in Paul Delta have been associated with cancers and other diseases such as MDPL and immunodeficiency disorders. And most of these mutations map on or near the polymerase active site. Surprisingly though, some of these mutations map at the interface between the two modules. In fact, the most common mutation, which is arginine to histidine mutation uh, of this amino acid 506, which corresponds to 511, in Paul Delta is at the interface between the exodomain and the regulatory module. Similarly, there are other mutations which um, underlie the pathology of the MD MDPL and immunodeficiency disorder. All of these mutations lie at this interface. And the presence of mutations here at the interface suggests that the integrity of the interface, both in terms of stability and flexibility, are important for the function of the holoenzyme. And so um, with our structure in hand now, these mutations can be tested uh, genetically and biochemically for their impact on the function of the enzyme. And so this brings me to my last slide, which is uh, conclusions. Um, so we've uncovered this unique architecture of the holoenzyme. And we've shown that CISBD is important for nucleating the architecture and is perhaps important for um, regulating its activity in response to redox stress. We show that disease mutations map at the interface between the catalytic and the regulatory module, and the interface is therefore very important for the function of the enzyme. And so with that, I'd like to thank the entire team that ha helped both with the small angle studies in 2008, the EM studies in 2008 and 18. I'm very grateful to Anil for giving me the opportunity to work on, these, on this very exciting project and for keeping my morale up when the experiments were not working. Um, and Radhika and Iban who helped us with grid preparation and initial data processing. 
um, Bill Rice, who was formerly at the Simons Electron Microscopy Center, now at NYU, for providing computational resources and also for helping us with multibody refinement. Um, the Prakash Lab and Bob Johnson for providing us cells for purification of the enzyme, and Dr. Hamill for the SAC studies. Also very grateful to Bridget, Clint, and Edward for um, helping us with troubleshooting and advice in general. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Rekha. That was a, a very interesting talk. And that, that redox sensor mechanism seems like that's, that's a very elegant story and a very elegant way for you know, the biological system to be working. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to um, um, want to bring up Jackie Barton's work on. She's done done some very cool electrochemical experiments with um, with proteins with a wide variety of proteins which have iron sulfur clusters, and some of her ideas are based on her work. But the structure definitely helps because um, we've elucidated the environment of the iron sulfur cluster, and that explains a lot of observations that she had based on. Her our electrochemical studies. So yeah, that arginine is very interesting. And the fact that it's present in only Paul Delta, but absent in the other B family polymerases makes this quite interesting because it makes Paul Delta uniquely um, suited to act as a redox sensor, whereas the other polymerases might not be able to switch in response to the redox stress. Yeah. So for, for the folks in the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to send them to me in chat. I will start working through some of the questions. So I one of them also touches into the redox sensor. And you'd mentioned the correspondence between the, the normal mode analysis and the, the multibody dynamics. Sure. Have you tried doing the normal mode analysis with the, the iron and the redox state and the, the oxidized state and seeing if that changes the dynamics or possibly shed some light onto the mechanism? I have not. And I think also because we don't have a structure of the holoenzyme with the um, iron cluster in the oxidized state. So I don't know how that affects the immediate geometry of the immediate environment of the cluster. And so we have not the normal mode analysis with the oxidized state of the enzyme. Is that, do you have, could you say anything about what you think your model of the, how the, the redox state manipulates the activity enzyme? Yeah, or sure. Um, so there are some ideas along these lines, which have been proposed by others and we agree with, which is um, when the iron sulfur cluster oxidized, it goes from the two plus to the three plus state, the increase in positive charge of the cluster is enough to enhance the affinity of the holoenzyme for the DNA. So what that means for an already strong binder is it becomes a very tight binder. And so once it becomes a tight binder, binder, it probably is unable to scan the, the template strand like a processive polymerase should. And so that leads to a stalling of the enzyme and halts DNA synthesis. So whereas a weak binder would go to a tight binder, already tight binder like polymerase delta, we know from binding experiments that Paul Delta has a high affinity for DNA, go, becomes a very strong binder. And in, in that sense, it essentially becomes a dead enzyme that's unable to move along. And so um, I, I think that explains very neatly how an oxidized enzyme might stall on the DNA. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question. So the, the cis AD domain it being not being disordered in the structure, is that in one of the intrinsically disordered domains or is that something that would be normally structured but just not visible with the, the cryo-EM experiment? Sure, so I think this I think that region has a structure, but it's probably moving around relative to the other domains. And so it does not show up in cryo-EM experiments. And I base this on um, some preliminary data that we have of the holoenzyme with other components of the replication fork, where we think we are starting to see cis-AD. 
And so it, it has structure, but it's moving relative to the other subunits that we have here in this work, and so just not visible in our experiment. Thank you. And I guess two, a, a combination of two related questions. So you, you mentioned three data sets for the, the initial collection. So the first part is that three data sets in terms of three separate grids or three different protein preparations? So three separate grids. So, um, and I think over two different protein purification runs because um, first we, could, we couldn't use frozen protein to make grids and we had to make fresh grids every time we did an experiment. Um, I think the reason we needed multiple grids is this complex was um, prone to um, um, uh, fragmentation upon freezing. And so there were very few particles of the holoenzyme that we got from each data set. And so we, we, we could have either tried optimizing grid preparation or we could stick to our protocol and just make more grids and collect additional data set. And at that time, um, uh, at that point of time, we decided to just stick with the protocol that had given us to the good to the class averages, just repeat that protocol and collect additional data sets also because Creo's time was available to us. So. And one, the, the second part of that question, did you use chameleon to freeze the grids? I did not because so I tried chameleon after these three data sets had been collected and while we were processing the data that we had in hand I tried chameleon once um, we were able to make a grid but the microscope malfunctioned <laughs> that uh, night and so we were not able to collect our, our data on the chameleon grid but the data set but the processing worked and we had our initial maps by then and so we did not pursue our chameleon experiments. Thank you and then that looks to be all the questions and so thank you thank you again for presenting. Thank you everyone. Now,